So hi everybody and welcome to this webinar on crop planning, year-round growing and hungry gap ideas and it's being led by Ben Raskin and Tom O'Kane who will introduce themselves in a minute. Um, and I'd yeah, like to start by asking everybody to go around and say who they are and their experience of growing. So what growing experience you've got and what kind of crop planning experience you've got. Um, maybe just a quick sentence on what you're hoping to get out of today. Um, I'll start by saying, and then if you can pass to somebody else and we'll make sure everybody gets a chance to speak. Um, I will start by saying I'm Susie Russell. I'm the coordinator of the CSA Network UK. I am not a grower other than on an allotment basis. So uh, I, my crop planning is very small scale. <laughs> And I will pass to Kate, as you are there at the moment. Yes, hello. Sorry, I didn't realise I wasn't muted. I will see if I can even say hello by... There we go. Hello. <laughs> um, I'm Kate. I am sort of currently pulling and washing carrots uh, <laughs> for an order. But um, I have got quite a few years of experience in growing. Um, my experience has been community gardens and therapeutic gardening and um, mainly on a slightly smaller scale, um, although I've done market gardening before and I'm currently running um, a market garden about an acre and a half under production at the moment. Um, crop planning, uh, I'm not sure how scientific I am about that, but we generally get it right for the amount of people we're uh, growing for, but um, we're upscaling, so it'd be really, really useful to get a better idea as to amounts um, to order and um, yeah, the hungry gap, I'm pretty keen on making sure there's food year round, but again, any ideas on that? And also, I'm really interested in how CSAs manage without buying in and whether we might need to buy in. Not sure about that. So those are the sort of questions I'd be really interested in hearing uh, your experience about. OK, thank you. Uh, I can't see anybody because I'm on the phone. So do you mind, Susie, choosing somebody next? That's fine. Uh, Adam, do you want to go next? Yeah, sure. Um, so yeah, I'm Adam from Good Vibe Veg uh, on Exmoor. Um, this is our first year and because we were quite late getting going, it was it's sort of turned into a sort of a trial year really. So we're pretty small scale at the moment, but hoping to scale up quite a bit for next year. So my experience of crop planning is small, um, certainly for a bigger scale, almost non-existent. And it's something that's sort of playing on my mind a bit of sort of so definitely some help in that respect is probably the main thing I want to get out of today but hungry gap ideas and everything else is good too okay um shall I choose uh Nikki hi everyone um I um work for community roots um CSA in Cornwall and we're a new CSA this is our first year um we've got a couple of um horticulturists in our um team um, they can't be here today, so I am. <laughs> I'm probably have sort of least experience, although I have a small holding here um, where I live and we have an acre at the farm. And yeah, we had a disastrous start with poor kind of um, compost this year. So our crops have been a bit of a disaster. So, but um, we're getting on it now. It's kind of um, coming good, but yeah, just any idea, all the things that other people have said, just kind of like support with kind of crop planning and particularly Hungry Gap, we're particularly interested in, so. Yeah, thank you. And I'm going to pass to Ben. Uh, hello, yes, I'm Ben. Um, I My background is commercial veg production, so I was a commercial grower for about 12 years, um, and I now work mainly for the Soil Association, um, where I head up their horticultural and agroforestry work. I'm also on the board of the CSA with Susie and Tom. Uh, I'll introduce a bit more fully when I, when I do my bit later. Uh, so if I pass, I don't know your name, sorry, but Arta Organics. Hi, uh, yeah, Dependera Singh from Arta Organics, first year market garden in Birmingham area. Um, don't really know much about farming, we're kind of just winging it this year, so <laughs> looking to learn as much as we can. Uh, I think I'll pass it on to Lisa. Hi, yeah, I'm Lisa from Edinburgh Agroecology Co-op. Uh, we're up me and Dave are both from the same organization. 
a big food growing enterprise that has we're hoping will be propagated next year. My experience of crop planning is quite limited. I did live on a, I guess it was a mix of sort of community farm market garden in Thailand for 10 years, but I wasn't really responsible for the crop planning. So. Uh, sorry, I'll pass to Tom. Thanks a lot. So yeah, Tom O'Kane, I'm with Kaitan CSA. We're based down on the Gao Peninsula and we're growing for about 130 households at the moment. And then we're also working with trainees and supporting other CSAs to set up and run a schools program as well. So I'll pass you over to Pat. Hi, um, I, my, myself and Lou, we're both from Growing Local. We've been going about 11 years. We're actually um, hoping to start our growing on a 16 acre site um, next, well, it could be March, it could be July. So we're just in the process of trying to find out as much as we can ahead of that. And uh, obviously uh, we know Tom, We've been around various um, farms and gardens and hope to see a few more yet. I'll pass to Lou, if Lou wants to add anything more to what I've said. Hi, sorry, I'm Lou. Yeah, um, so Growing Local has been going for 12 years, but really we bought most of our veg to, from other local producers um, to supply a veg box scheme. And we ran a school's education and an educational garden. Um, so we have, you know, we've got a sort of fair amount of growing experience, but not on this scale. And obviously we're taking on a huge venture next year. So we're, we're out to get as much information as we possibly can at this very early stage. Thanks. Um, I can't see who else have I, is it Dave? Yeah. Can I pass to Dave or I can't see anybody else that hasn't spoken, but I might be wrong. Hi, yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Hi, I'm Dave. Um, yeah, also Lauriston Farm in Edinburgh. Um, I have uh, been doing community supported agriculture since 2016, but never taken a lead on crop planning. Um, so was at a market garden in Perthshire, uh, Taybank Growers, but um, it just we were a workers co-op and the way that sort of the division of stuff happened, um, others were stronger on the crop planning. So now coming to the project in Edinburgh, like I'm just aware it's one of the gaps. So looking to sort of get my head around a wee bit more of the crop planning and also like inform the decision about this about the hunger gap and about um how long a season to aim for basically uh, because we've not set up yet we're sort of i get, can kind of make that decision what sort of to aim for um and like want to make an informed decision so kind of like interested to hear other folks experience and um yeah and i'm not sure who's left is there anybody left um, we heard from Nikki. I think that's everyone. Yep. So over to, oh, uh, there's one person just coming in actually. Just let them in. Hi, Lisa. We've just done a round of introductions. So you've just arrived in time to say who you are and what growing and crop planning experience you've got uh, and what you're hoping to get out of today, if that's not too much. Hello, Lisa. Oh, sorry. Um, hang on a second. I've only just arrived. Can, can you go to someone else first and come back to me, if that's OK? We've kind of done everyone else, but you can oh, sorry, it if you want. Because I'm late, yeah. Um, <laughs> um, I've um, crop experience. I've, I've been growing for the last 15 years, but on an allotment. Um, just about to get the lease to a two acre field um, to set up a market garden and, and a CSA. Um, so just need to be a bit more um, uh, professional about it um, in terms of planning and getting that consistency really. So yeah, that's my experience. Thanks Lisa. 
Okay, I will hand over to Ben and Tom. There may be a few more people coming in as we go along. Thanks a lot, Susie. So um, I think the plan is I'm going to start and I'll give you a bit of an introduction to how we do our crop planning at Kaitan. And um, then we'll hand over to Ben. But in between, we'll stop after my section and do discussion and questions and whatnot then. And then um, I think the same after Ben. So um, yeah, I had actually prepared a video for this. I thought last week, the end of last week, I was full of flu. And when, I've, when I was full of flu, I thought oh, I've got to do something useful with my time. So I thought I can't really do much work. So I'll put this video together. And actually it was a pretty bad idea because it came out all pretty mumbled and like the, the sound on it was bad and it was all sort of blurred. So I'm going to basically cover the same kind of stuff I was doing there, but I'm going to, I will dip into that video at the end to give you a little tour of the field. So um, yeah, crop planning, why we do crop planning. I mean, largely, so we have the right crops for the season and we don't have wastage. And so we use the ground area most effectively. And we're sort of looking at fertility building and best use of resources, lack of waste, and also um, what your membership likes. So for, for me, actually, when we started up at Kaitan, the, that's sort of the, the point I started at was because I didn't know that there were crop plans out there, which I think Ben's going to talk through some online crop plans afterwards. There's different crop plans you can sort of can start working with. But I didn't know about those when I started up. So what, what I did was think of what me and my family would eat because I'd been growing on a sort of an acre, a couple of acres on and off for years. So I kind of knew seasonally what we could grow and I knew what we like to eat as a family. So we started from that point that I just got a, a spreadsheet and I put into that spreadsheet everything that we would grow over the season, how long we think it would store for, roughly how much we would think we would eat each week. Um, and then we kind of built it from that. And then at the end, I just multiplied that by 50 for our first year at Kaitan. And amazingly, that actually, that worked pretty well. That's, we've got a pretty good um, quantities and variety of veg the first year. And then what we did beyond that, every year at the end of the season, we would do a, a survey monkey and ask all our members what they liked, what they didn't like. And then gradually through the seasons for the last six years, we've done that every year. And then we've gradually cut out things that people don't like, tried to grow more of what people do like, but obviously within reason, because at the end of the day, there's some things that are much easier to grow than others. And people might not necessarily pick those up and buy them if they were in a shop, but actually they're really easy for us to produce and they're prolific for long periods of the year. So, so we grow them. Um, I was just thinking like we do we do chard a lot of the year, which I think in this country, you know, a lot of people don't really buy chard or have chard available. And it's not something people would think about eating regularly, but it's something that we can produce fairly easily. So that's just an example of one. Um, and things actually we've gradually moved out of out of our cropland pretty much are. Uh, sadly for some of our members are the swedes and turnips we've just found consistently year after year they're quite a nice easy crop to grow but we've just found that our members did most of our members don't really want swedes and turnips or they don't want many of them so you know gradually we've refined our rotation and our crop plan to sort of fit roughly what people would like so um i'm going to show you a quick if I can screen share, I think I can. I'm going to show you, this is just to give you a picture of our site, because we are, we're on the Gower Peninsula in South Wales. We are uh, producing for 130 households and we're on two sites. I'll just flip between, this is our Websfield site. That's actually an old picture in the summer when the ground is pretty dried out. And then this is our second site, a picture of it from last winter. So this is the Furs Hill site. And this is kind of a much more productive, easier to work site. So between the two sites, we've got 
about eight acres. It's always hard to say. Yeah, we've got about eight acres that are, some of it is workable. I'd say very workable area. We've got five, six, seven, probably about six acres that we regularly cultivate and harvest from. And then we've now got five polytunnels. There's in this field, in Webb's field, there's a fifth polytunnel just going up at the moment. Um, so that's just to give you an idea of the site we're working on. And that's, like I said, producing for 130 households. And then this is to show you our basic rotation. We've kind of split the fields now between a summer cropping down here in Webb's field because it's a very wet site and it's difficult to get in and out over the winter. So this season we've got a summer brassica on the, this is on the main field now. Um, and then green manuring, which would have been onions and, and um, garlic over winter. And then a large part of the field this year was squash and sweet corn. And then our polytunnels, they are a mixture of, we've got aubergines, peppers, then we've got a tomato tunnel, then we've got three tunnels that are kind of a mixture of various crops. And we'll talk through it, you'll see that when we look at the cropping plan afterwards. Our main rotation involves moving the tomato tunnel, the aubergine tunnel, and then everything else we fit in between the other three tunnels. So within there, there would be, so in the summer, lots of beans, um, beans, greens that might be more sensitive inside, greens and salads at certain times of the summer. Um, but the vast majority of actually those three tunnels, we tend to grow a lot of beans now because we find they're, they're more productive inside than outside for us. Um, and easier to manage. And then over winter, the tunnels are constantly full. So, oh, actually saying that, the middle tunnel would also be uh, cucumbers and I'm trying to think what's in the cucumber tunnel at the moment or just gone out. Actually, no, half of the middle tunnel was cucumbers and again, the other half of it was beans. So um, over winter, our tunnels would be stocked up with garlic, spring greens, salads, I'd say probably 60% of our tunnels are salads and greens over the winter. And they're, they're sort of picking, like the, mo the main period for our salads is picking them from January through till April, May. They're like super productive in the tunnels. And then we also have early carrots, early courgette, early kohlrabi, um broad beans which are overwintered which will be sowing soon and early french beans early fennel but we we can see more of this afterwards when we when we start to look at the cropping plan this is just to give you a, a kind of overview of the sites so our second site is owned by the ecological land co-op and this is a much more productive site it's a much um easier soil to work it drains better it's to some degree more fertility parts of it. The main field has really high fertility, the back field not. The back field actually has a lot of weed problems and low fertility, but generally it's a much easier site to manage. So up here in effect, we have like the main bulk of our crops. So we've got a potato crop and followed by brassicas, followed by onion and leeks, followed by roots mixed in with various other roots and friends in there at the moment. We've got um, carrot, parsnip, beetroot, celery, celeriac, fennel, and chard. And then after that, we've got a fertility building phase. So that's our basic, that's just to give you an overview of the sites and the basic rotation. And then I'm gonna show you our cropping plan, our current cropping plan. So like I said, we've just started with, with what we would eat as a family. And then we've got, I don't know whether you can see all of this, the bottom row here of these spreadsheets, but each year we've basically adapted our, our spreadsheet. So we've got, well, 2016. And then if we move on, I'll just move on to our most recent one. So we've actually, if anything, we've simplified our cropping plan 
as we've gone through. I think in the first couple of years, we built a lot into the cropping plan um, about successional sowing and about which green manures we use before and after crops. But what we found was actually, it was, it was easier to keep that information set for us, separate for us in the basic cropping plan. So actually we scaled our cropping plan back to something very simple, which is this. So if I show you what's in it in the top bar, we basically got the crop, we've got who sows it. So whether that's myself or Lizzie as the, uh, as the other grower, we take, we take responsibility for a crop. And that's something we'll do. We're starting to split also between the trainees. So right from the beginning of the season, we'll basically give everyone certain crops they're responsible for. We all work together on all the crops, but basically each of us as individuals would think about what varieties they would want to order, how much of that crop they would want to order, obviously based on what we grew the, the previous season and any management decisions that are made along the way like, you know, when to harvest it, when not to harvest it, when to weed it, you know, we'd all sort of do that together, but a person would be responsible for how each crop is managed. Then we've got a column of total crop number. And then we've got a column of plants per square meter. So some of those are relevant, some not. And then we've got a total area that we're planting for that crop. And then we've got our sowing dates. So the sowing dates, we still go on the biodynamic sowing calendar. My background and training was in biodynamics and I, I find it a useful tool to actually just plan the growing for the season. So we do work that around the sowing calendar. And then we've got a column of all the varieties that we order. So the vast majority over the last few years, we've been ordering from the seed cooperative and now, like I'll just show you there, for example, the carrots. So, you know, we'll, we used to just write the variety, but now we keep a track of how many grams we've got as well, which is really useful. It took us a few years of actually calculating every year what weights we needed of different crops before we actually remembered to write it down so we didn't have to work it out every year. And then we try to be conscientious that if we have a lot of seed left over, or if we didn't have enough seed and we did a different a, a second order or a third order, then we'll try and go back to the spreadsheet and adjust it. So then we just see if I can get this. Um, how am I going to get that out of that? There. So if you can, I've just moved the box for me. So and then with the last column is other seed suppliers. So then that's just like any other companies that we buy seed from and what quantities. Um, everything we get, all of our crops we buy, we seed and sow them directly or in seed trays, the vast majority in seed trays, but just these ones, the cellar in celeriac, we buy from Delflands. So that's that's because our, our hot box that we sow in is basically, too is too small for us at that time of year when we've got all our peppers and aubergines and tomatoes in the hot box we can't fit all the 10 15 trays of cellar and celeric in there so we buy those in from delflands and that's quite handy you know if you haven't got the space to to start everything off that's really useful so what i'm going to do that is the basic oh i'll show you just down so the spreadsheet then sort of if we if we look down the side is split up in the different crop groups. So firstly, we've got um, Furs Hill, which is this green section. And then we've got Ilston, which is the blue section. And then we've got Winterfield down in Ilston. And then we've got this purple section, which is the polytunnel. And then we've got the last, well, the gray section there, which is the winter polytunnel. So that's how we've divided it up, kind of the main block of summer cropping up here. And then the main crop at block of summer plantings in the second field, and then winter plantings, summer planting in the polytunnel, winter planting in the polytunnel. I'm just thinking I'll show you which one of these. Um, well, I tell you, that's 
that's actually there's there's not much more to say that without actually going through it and looking at detail of varieties and quantities and numbers. So I'm I'm quite happy to send that on to anyone afterwards who's interested in it because those those kind of quantities work for us. Obviously, that would have to be adaptable to whoever 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 used this spreadsheet but we have sent that on to other groups who have used it as a basis to sort of to to make a bit of a plan for their own sewing so i'll leave that sheet and i'm just going to jump back to the sewing and harvesting plan so this is just an overall picture so down the side in green we've got all the crops that we grow through the year and across the top we've got our months of the year and then the blue the blue set, the blue highlight is where we're harvesting a crop from fresh. The red is where we're storing a crop. And that's it, actually. I've, I have put in there pot sown and soil sown, but actually really now we're just looking at these, the, the colors of what we're gonna, what crops we've got when. And I thought specifically, if we look at April, May, June, which is the hungry gap, We've, we've sort of gradually built this up from year by year. I didn't say that at the start actually, but when we, when we started out, we were only on, we only cultivated about an acre and a half the first year and we were supplying 50 households. So we basically just grew all the high value produce and we bought in all the potatoes, onions, carrots, beetroot. We grew some of those on a small scale for the summer but the vast majority of the bulk of produce that we could buy in cheaply organic wholesale, we just bought in. And that was a really, that was a really, um, it, sa it saved us a lot of work and stress in the early years to do that. So I, I, I mean, it's really up to who's starting the scheme, how confident they feel, how much surface area you've got, what resources you have, but there's nothing wrong with starting out, making it as easy as possible for yourself and just growing the really high value stuff and buying in the cheaper stuff. And we have gradually worked around then to trying to grow for the whole season. We still don't manage it. And we still always have to buy in something in this period of April, May, June. But it varies from year to year, depending on the harvest. And sometimes that has been very minimal. I mean, there was a year, I think two years ago, where we had really good harvest for and really and produce stored really well and i think it was only for about six weeks from mid-may till the end of june that we had to buy in potatoes and carrots and everything else we had had from the field or from the polytunnels so i'm just going to talk through what we've got in this little section april may june so main crop onion we store them just loose on the floor in the polytunnel and they will store, they'll start to sprout in May. And overwinter onion, generally, generally, actually, to be honest, the, the, the overwinter onion, we do harvest it in June, but we haven't had very good results with it. And we're sort of contemplating giving up the overwinter onion and moving over to just growing lots of fresh garlic. Because actually the garlic we're finding is growing really well. It's much more productive. And it's actually, there's a lot more crop there basically when it comes to harvesting in June. So we are, we're gonna do winter onion again this winter, but possibly not in the future, depending on how it goes this year. Spring onion in the polytunnel, sowings in February, March, and we're harvesting them April, May, June. Um, wet garlic, so fresh garlic from the polytunnel, sown in October, and we're picking that April, May, June. And that's a real winner for us, like the garlic. The last few years, we've been putting loads of garlic in both the polytunnel and the field. And it fills that gap for us when we run out of onions. And then we've got our wet garlic, fresh garlic from the field, May, June, and dry garlic. You could possibly have dry garlic still stored then as well, but I don't think we will. It will be the end of our leek crop. So we'll be harvesting them through April and they'll be bolting in May. Radishes, which we're sowing, well, February, March, April, May, and eating them April, May, June in the tunnel. We don't bother doing radishes any other time of year, 
but just for that, just for the hungry gap, we find they're like a really nice little extra. The salads, in theory, we can keep the salads going 12 months of the year. And sometimes we do, sometimes we don't, but that's what we aim for. Um, but with the polytunnels, it's, yeah. There's a really good article actually by Charles Dowding in the, it was in the OGA magazine a good few years back. And we based all our winter sowings on that short article, um, which is basically, um, he, he suggested a load of varieties in there, which we've also adapted. But we do most of our salad sowing for winter in, I think, between the first and the second week of September. And we plant them in second, third week of October. And then basically those salads are really good from pretty much from January right through till May. And then the others are sort of more your regular salad sowings for the summer period. And then if we jump down to spring cabbage in the tunnel. So we've sown spring cabbage about a month ago. Um, loads of it actually for inside and outside. Um, we just we just but it's you know, it's it's a fairly cheap and easy crop for seed wise and everything so we've just sown a huge amount of spring cabbage and we'll just fill as much in the tunnels in areas that we know we can fit within the brassica rotation in the tunnel and then everything we can't fit in the tunnel we'll plant out in the field and we've got space in our summer brass no in our winter brassicas we've left space for them to overwinter there the um then we've got spring collies Spring collies are really touch and go. We like, yeah, we're, we're sowing them in May and then they're sitting right the way round and possibly coming and heading in April and May the following year. But to be honest, actually, they're really hit and miss the cauliflowers. And ones we've sown for April, May might well come between now and January, February, March. We don't know. They seem to, they've sort of got a mind of their own, the cauliflowers. Um, Hungry Gap Kale is one we found really good. That variety will pick right through April and May. Purple Sprout and Broccoli, we've got varieties that will go through April, May. Again, actually, if I sent you this, this crop plan, it's got all the varieties written in to our, into, the, into the spreadsheet there. Broad Beans through May and June. They're both, we have the Broad Beans both in the tunnel and outside which we're sowing, we'll be sowing them in trays in October. And um, yeah, some of those planting out, some of them going in the tunnel. And then we've got peas and monge too, early sown March, April. So we can get them in that hungry gap as well in June, harvesting them. And then again, pea monge too, tunnel. Oh, why have I got, I don't know why I've got two lots of that there. So there's, but basically, yeah, May and June, we could be harvesting those. We've actually, another thing we've done is stopped pretty much doing the peas and monge too outside, just because it's such a time factor in picking them at that time of year when it's like the bulk of our ground preparation and planting. So actually, yeah, that's why going back to that, the peas and monge too, the first one is June and July. Those are the outdoor pickings. And we found that period of May, June, July, is so manic for ground preparation and all the later plantings that actually we just don't really have time to pick our peas and monge too. So we're only now doing early sowings of them in the tunnel when it's a bit quieter and then leaving the outdoor ones. So beetroot, we've stored, this year we've stored in sand. I'll show you briefly afterwards how we're doing that. So we can eat those, save those for May and June. We've got the end of our parsnips in April, carrot from the polytunnel, which is sown in October and again in January. We'll be harvesting those in May and June. And the carrot main crop will still be okay in April. And then it starts to go kind of hairy and woody by May, June. So um, all of these things, actually quantities of them and space-wise, it really depends on obviously how much polytunnel space you've got but like the carrots we're finding in the polytunnel, we've started doing the last few years and they do, they do really well. So we're dedicating more space to them. So we've probably got like for our 130 households, we've still only got three beds of 25 meters. 
um, we harvest the carrots fairly small, but that means basically those three beds of 25 meters means that we pretty much, probably for about six weeks, we've got a carrot crop in that period, which is, which is really valuable to us rather than buying something else in. And then if we go down to courgette in the tunnel, sown in March, picking in June, chard sown in March, picking in June. And then we got squash from store. So this year we've got a good like two and a half thousand or so squash. And we're going to put about five or 600 into wooden crates, insulated crates. That's something we haven't tried, but I've seen it done at another CSA. I saw them doing it on Facebook. So we're basically building big boxes, a bit like beehives, and then we'll layer them with squash. They'll be um, vermin proof top and bottom and with airflow underneath sitting on pallets. And we'll stack all the squash in and then just keep putting straw in and make layers and layers of squash packed in straw. And there's a particular varieties of squash we've been told that will store better than others. So we're gonna go for those. We're, we're gonna pick those out from our crop and try and store those. So that, that's a bit of a trial this year. And again, if we can have squash right through April, May, possibly into June, that'll be a real bonus for the saving buying in. Um, cucumbers. I think we've done cucumbers already, but oh, that's, yeah, that maybe that's the main crop. I'm not sure why I put that in again. But cucumbers, the end of June. Parsley, which is overwintered, we'll be picking right through the winter, just a bed or half a bed of that. We'll be able to pick that still in April. And then we've got early potatoes. This one is, I'm not sure about. We did this last year. Um, and to be honest, the ones that came in the tunnel weren't as nice as the ones outside, which we were harvesting in, Ju in July. So I don't know, people have luck with that, but I don't think we're gonna do that again this year. I'd, I'd rather dedicate like the early potato space to more early carrots or overwinter brassicas or something that's more reliable. We didn't get great results with early potatoes in the tunnels. Um, we've got the remainder of our main crop potato, which is, should be sitting till April if we've got enough. I don't know actually quantity wise this year. I think ours are probably gonna run out in March, but if there was slightly more in the boxes, they would store okay until April. And then, yeah, potentially we've got our earlies coming in mid end of June. And then kohlrabi sown in February in the tunnel. That's been, that's worked really well for us the last couple of years and fennel sown early also in February to pick in May and June. So that's like, that's, yeah, that's just gives you an overview of that period of the year, which is the most difficult time of year to produce for. So in a way, if you can crack that period of April, May, June, and get as much produce as possible in that period, the rest of the year is, is easier than this period. Um, so, Tom, there's a quick question from Pat. Um, yeah. You haven't mentioned asparagus or rhubarb as early crops. Any thoughts? Yeah, well, actually, we have we have done both. Um, and we still currently do rhubarb. Yeah, that's a really good one. I hadn't actually put that in here, but we do have rhubarb in the field. Um, asparagus, it hasn't worked well for us. We've just found it. I don't think we're on the right soil, but people do, people do, yeah, grow that as an early crop. So, yeah, definitely that would be worth trying. But we found it quite time consuming to weed and manage, and we didn't get a huge quantity out of it. But I think that was because of possibly of where we planted it. It's worth, Tom, as well. I know um, Pete Dollimore down on the south coast, who's an amazing grower, you know, sort of more doing teaching, but he had, they had a big glass house um, and they used to do very early asparagus in the glass house. Although he said it was marginally profitable, um, he said the excitement from their, I mean, they were not a CSA, they were a box scheme, but their excitement from their customers about it sort of meant that he kept doing it, kept doing it. You know, the sort of the value to, to, the, to the whole business was greater than the, the sort of profitability of a particular crop. So sometimes a decision about whether to grow something is more than just, you know, does it really pay for itself in terms of space and labour? Sometimes it can 
it can make the difference between people staying or not staying if you've got that sort of early excitement. Yeah, that yeah, that's a really good point, actually. Um, I'm just going to finish up. I'm going to give you, this is from the video I was putting together, which didn't come out very well. You hear the sound is actually quite bad on bits of it. But I'll show you this, because this is just, I think if I just show you this section, it's less than 10 minutes. And it's basically just a quick tour of where our fields are at at the moment. What crops we what crops we're kind of looking to store for winter and grow and harvest through the winter. So starting here, I think. The sound will improve on it. Can't hear you at all at the moment. I think it will, it should come. So I'll just, I'll make this. Ah, okay, yeah. So this is basically the, the beetroot store, which we're trying this year. Back and it worked well. So all of our summer beetroots, I'll show you, we do a batch of summer and a batch of winter beetroots. So all the remainder of the summer beetroots are now in these bags, which is probably three quarters beetroot and a quarter sand. And um, you can see it's just lots of nice beetroot in there buried in the sand. So we're hoping that those, well, yeah, we've done it before. We have done it once before and it's worked well. And um, we're going to store those right through to the hungry gap. Again, the, the sound disappears for a bit, but this is just showing you inside the barn, the potato store at the back. Because we've had... So this is yeah. a black proof area. You can see concrete base. All the walls are lined, metal lined. You can't see them behind there. Then we've got sort of an internal wall of straw stuffed into pallets and then wound with wire to hold it all together. And so the whole the whole store is basically rat proofed with concrete and metal lining. And um, then in there, well, there's this mesh actually on the front, which is you know good solid rodent proof mesh. And then there's some uncovered, but generally you keep those covers on to keep the frost and light off the top as well. And um, we've got stored in these boxes enough potatoes for our membership to go from now until about March, mid-March. If there was more, if they were fuller up, we'd go right through till May, but um, we should be fine till, till sometime in March this year. So this was the, that's the parsnip crop, which five beds of 60 meters for our membership. Uh, two beds of winter beetroot. So summer ones are all packed in sand. And then we've got nine beds of carrots. These beds are all about 80 meters. These ones are about 60, well, 60 to 80, but most of them are 80. The carrots as well, the initial crop failed. And the, so this was a second sowing, which means that it's going to be slightly late being lifted. Um, so we're probably going to start eating those in, well, sometime in October. Then we've got two beds of celeriac, half a bed left of celery down there, fennel that's finished, summer beetroot finished, chard, uh, the chard will sit through the winter. So that's the, what was the summer chard bed? We will get pickings out of it early next spring before our new chard comes through in the tunnel and then the next lot of chard comes through in the field. Our fertility building block, which is to be mowed soon and re-sown. And then we've got uh, where the potatoes were. That's going to be fertility sown over winter as well. So there's going to be uh, rye and vetch going in there. We have done other mixes over the years, but this year we're going just for rye and vetch because cereal rye and vetch that is rather than than um, the grass rye. And um, that's because it's worked really well for us, better than other ones over the last few years. And then we've got our brassica area. So we've got kale, cabbage, more kale, more cabbage, more kale, more kale, which all of those, there's not the hungry cat. Oh, there is a batch of hungry cat kale further down there. But so all of that will be 
that's sitting. The cabbages we find tend to only last until sort of December, January, and then they don't really hold very well. Um, even though you can get varieties that sit longer, we haven't had much luck with them. Maybe our sort of damp, warm winters don't suit them. The kale will will keep picking that right the way through till say March, April before it all will finally bolt. And then we've got purple sprout and broccoli, which hopefully will sit through and we'll be picking that right through March, April. And then we've got a batch of cauliflowers, a few rows of cauliflowers, which are all set to come much later on as well. Um, so not as far, not quite as far as the hungry gap, but head in that way. More kale, more collies. So actually these collies will hopefully come, you know, potentially come for the hungry gap, but we don't really know whether they, they might decide to come a bit earlier. And then we've got a few more beds going in here of a mixture of green manures and spring greens. And there's one I didn't mention, actually. We've got a big area here of rhubarb, which is looking a bit overgrown at this time of year. But again, that's a great one for the hungry gap. This variety, you know, through June, we should, we'll be able to pick this quite heavily. So then coming into the back field, this is where the onion and leek beds were this year. This field has actually had a real weed and low fertility problem. So we've put a lot of compost onto it. And this year we've planted the leeks through this biodegradable membrane. And actually, they're doing really well. They're, um, yeah, we haven't started lifting them yet because they are slightly later than usual. Normally by now, they'd be pretty bigger than this, but, you know, I reckon give it another three weeks or a month and we'll start lifting those. And this crop should last us right through until April. I think we've got enough here to keep lifting them till April when they'll start bolting. And then what was the onion patch up there? I'll show you what's happened to them. We'll, again, it's sort of pretty, no, it's a pretty mild climate. Um, so yeah, we don't really need to, to lift everything and store it or even to lay straw down over the crops or whatever over winter. We'd kind of, yeah, we're lucky in that respect. Beginning of the squash crop, which um, we've done a large amount of squash this year. You know, we could should have at least a couple of thousand. Um, they've gotten quite weedy, but there's a very good crop in there. We started, started lifting them on the other side. Sweet corn's just finished. First decent, really good crop of sweet corn we've had for a couple of years. Courgettes are gone, they're finished. So we've just started lifting squash from this section. And then that's going to carry on all uh, Monday, we'll finish off. Then we're going to have overwinter onions going in here where the green manures were. Both those patches of green manures. And then garlic is going to go in this section, overwinter outdoor garlic, which will partly be eaten fresh green garlic next June, and some of it will be dried. A bit of kale and a few cabbages. This was sort of mostly summer summer greens in this patch, which uh, a lot of just bolted and gone now. Then the polytunnels are kind of in, just in sort of changeover phase at the moment. Um, so yeah, a lot of beans have come out. All the aubergines, tomatoes and whatnot in the other tunnels are all still in, but going to be coming out imminently in October. And they're going to be replaced with a lot of these crops down here, which are salads and greens, uh, spring greens and whatnot. And then you can see our onion crop. We just bring that in and we lay it on, um, not, on the, not on the membrane, but on silage plastic so no dampness comes up and they'll just carry on drying in here and that lot doesn't well does it look like much it doesn't look like much from here but that will last us those onions will last us right the way through the winter probably till april hopefully and the squash winter squash which we started collecting i'd say that's about i think that's about a quarter of them looking at the field so yeah so what we're going to do with those is we will store a load in here 
and use them up by Christmas. And then at six, at six or 800 or so, we're planning this year on packing into crates and storing over winter until the hungry gap. I'm sorry about the sound quality on some. Right, so that's that was just that bit I was going to show just to give you a bit of a look around the field. And I think actually I'm going to leave it there and um, pass you over to Ben. But I has anyone got any questions in the meantime? If you've got questions, unmute yourselves and speak because I can't see everybody. Can I just ask a question, Susie? Sorry, my video is off, but can I just ask a question? Can we please have a video? <laughs> yes. Of the, the recording of this? Yes. 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 Thank because you. it's it's a lot to sort of it's a lot to take in and there's there's so much detail within all of it um so yeah it's kind of just a brief overview really but yeah and, and also you're totally welcome to have i might have even given that to you already pat our cropping plan but you're totally welcome to have a look at that to look at varieties and quantities that we're using yeah 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 i need to see what exactly what we have got but all of that is really would be really useful yeah okay yeah, I agree. That would be absolutely fantastic to have copies of your of both of those spreadsheets. That would be amazing. Okay, great. Thank you. Can I just ask a question? Um, when you talk about buying in, sort of what sort of how much sort of notice do you need to give to people the people that you're ordering from? Do you need to know? basically sort of now for next year or or can you can no. you order it sort of with a couple of weeks or whatever i think it really depends on where you are in the country and it's worth you looking into that yeah. because i know chatting to charlotte down in cornwall they had a real issue with trying to buy in wholesale at some point last year i don't know whether they still do but we find in there, we've got an option of about three different organic wholesalers who are all right at the last minute Do you know we can we can ring them and say oh, we want we want these six sacks of this and three bags of that by next Wednesday. And so we, we're in a lucky position that we've got like a group of wholesalers, organic wholesalers. Um, but I don't know whether that is the same across the country. I think it'd be really worth you checking who you've got locally. I think also worth saying that uh, where it, even where it hasn't been a problem in the past, it might be a problem, particularly next year. There's quite a lot of growers are putting in less crop less year next year because they're nervous about um <clears throat> you know getting labor to pick it and transport you know all the brexit problems which obviously puts you as producers in a very strong position but it does mean if you're thinking of buying in it might be challenging um at certain times so that's just kind of worth bearing in mind i had a couple of questions tom uh, the first one was those sacks of beetroot in sand do you then put them somewhere rodent proof and the second was uh, which is probably a silly question and it's just lack of experience but I'd noticed on a photo you that I saw you've got propagation sort of pallets hanging over what I think was charred and I was just wondering how that worked in terms of shading like are you just are you growing stuff constantly under hanging propagation benches or is that just for a little bit of the year well the beetroot um we figured actually it's sitting in the field all year as well, right next to the sacks. So we don't think when we've done that before, we haven't had a rodent problem. We've, but, you know, we had a major rodent problem on the potatoes the first year when we stored them without making it rat proof. So I honestly don't know why they're not going for the beetroot, but they're going for the potatoes, but they don't seem to bother them. Um, and the hanging, the hanging seed trays. Yeah, we do. We, we put them there actually particularly for sowing beans because we're sowing all the, the beans over next week for the overwinter beans. Um, so we put those up again to stop mice getting up there because we've had real mice problems with eating the beans and eating beetroot. Actually, more and more, they'll start to eat any seeds at all, we find. So actually, as much of the time as we can, we'll put them on the hanging trestles. And it doesn't seem to really bother once the crop is established. Actually, it seems to grow just as well under the hanging trestles as it does does 
in the open. That's what we found anyway. It doesn't really seem, mostly we've done it over the chard and salads and actually they seem to be fine. Thanks. Anyone else got any more questions? So do people want a sort of two minute stand up and stretch break before we head into the second hour? Will that be, uh, uh, certainly I'd kind of benefit from standing up, I think. <laughs> that sounds great. Should we say come back at five past? That's four minutes. Hey, See you all in a minute. <laughs> because you're too noisy. Dad. Just have some lunch. Right, please, Dad. please, Forrest, I need to Dad. listen to this conversation.
hard to tell how many people are back. See Pat, that's all. <laughs> okay. Hang on a little bit more. I don't know, Adam juggling his work life balance, I see. Right, I think we'll we'll probably crack out. How are you doing, Adam? You managed to get some food down him. <laughs> yeah, he's quiet for a minute. We'll see how long it lasts. He's a, <laughs> he usually naps around this time, but typically today he's not doing that. So apologies if he's a bit distracting, but Fine, no problem at all. If need be, I'll turn the video part off. So it might he might be less <laughs> interested then. <laughs> so what I'm going to do, I'm going to pick up a little bit from where um, Tom left off, and I, there's a couple of things I'm going to do. I'm going to look at um, the crop planning tool that I originally developed as part of the Soil Association CSA project that we ran about 12 years ago. Um, but then also just to pick up on a few themes and principles that you can tie into your crop planning um, as you go forward. You know, obviously you've got a really great example with Tom that he's going to share with you, but everybody's, uh, you know, everybody's needs is slightly different. Your soil might be different, your box numbers, all of that stuff. So, and, and you know, certainly from your introductions, a lot of you are at the point of, you know, you've got some of that growing experience, but it's the scaling up and, you know, how do you go from feeding you know, four of you from an allotment to feeding 50 people or 100 people. And that, you know, that's the challenge, I think, for a lot of growers on CSAs. And it's certainly a challenge that I've gone through, you know, as part of my growing as well. Um, so if I just uh, share my screen. Uh, so that was, oh, let me just hide the chat as well. Can you see that all right? Um, so that was just me again, just um, the, I'm not particularly uh, using this to plug all my books, um, although the Woodchip Handbook is coming out in November, quite excited. But the, the reason I put it up really is the Zero Waste Gardening book was inspired a little bit by the crop planning stuff. So when I researched, tried to do research for how much you needed to plant in certain places to feed so many people. The information, certainly 10 years ago, and it was really hard to get hold of and was quite conflicting. Um, so although the, that Zero Waste Gardening book is a bit um, gardener focused rather than grower focused, it's got some quite good information on how much crops, space crops take up and um, plugging that in. So that might be useful. Um, but what I, what I was going to cover a little bit was around fertility and green manuring and building that into your uh, into your crop planning. So you know, you it's sometimes it's quite easy to say, okay, well I need you know 100 cabbage plants. That's how much space they take up. Um, <clears throat> but then you also need to make sure you've got fertility for the bits. You know, to keep those crops going and keep them growing really well over the course of the rotation. Um, I'm going to cover a little bit around sowing methods. So that's, you know, whether to direct sow, whether to use modules. Um, obviously, that has an impact on how long crops are in the ground for, when you need to put them in, you know, and where you can juggle early and late crops. A uh, little bit around crop desiccation. So certainly when I started, I had this sort of feeling that I had to, you know, as soon as the crop was dead, I had to get it out of the ground onto the next one. But actually, sometimes there's a real benefit to leaving those sort of crops to go through their cycle in the ground and, and finish off. So we'll touch on that a little bit and then talk a little bit about tunnels and crop planning. Um, but also really just thinking at the back of it, all of this, I, you know, all of the crop planning, all of sort of working out how much to grow and what to grow. It's all around maximizing those free resources of soil, sunlight and water to hit the growing targets that you set yourself, you know, whether that's growing everything or growing some things and buying other things in. 
Um, and, and sort of making decisions about some of those stuff, you know, if you bear in mind that it's just, it's all about how do you make the best use of, of what nature's got to offer you. Um, and I would, you know, think about bringing in some of those perennial crops, you know, bringing in trained fruit trees, you know, agroforestry and small horticultural systems are a really good way of maximizing space. You know, you can use, uh, it doesn't have to be a big row, it can be five, six feet tall, but a trained fr fruit tree is a good windbreak, it's productive uh, and potentially helps sort of split up growing areas. So thinking about in integrating some of those perennial and tree crops into your crop planning, I think is probably also uh, worth thinking about. So I'm just gonna um, go out of this briefly, if I can. Um, and pull up the crop planning tool. So I do need to caveat this with I'm a grower and not an IT specialist. So this is a bit sort of basic and clunky. Um, and there's, I'll show you another version um, that someone else developed from it. Um, and Susie, I, I, when I looked on the CSA website, the link for this wasn't working. So I'm guessing that it's because of the um, website redevelopment. So I'm sure it, it is. Be. Yes, uh, apologies people that we are, our website is sh shifting over to a new one as we speak. So the resources are gonna be up and running by next Tuesday at our AGM, but the link is broken at the moment. Yeah, that's what I guessed. Um, but, I mean, we can send this round to, to you anyway, even if it's not available, but it will be very soon. So the, the reason for me doing this spreadsheet originally was exactly this question of, you know, okay, I've, you know, I wanna feed hundred members. Uh, I don't know how much to grow and how much space it's gonna take out. So it's just not an exhaustive list of crops, um, which is where, you know, you might need to, if you've got a particular crop that you wanted to grow that isn't in there, you might need to do a bit of extra research. You know, there is a lot more information obviously available now than there was 10 years ago on the internet, but it is some of it is quite conflicting um the other thing to bear in mind is that uh, and actually i'm not sure if that's now doesn't appear to be on this version but i did originally have a a little button that you could press according to whether you want to put in high or medium or low yields and the basis of that was um there's obviously a lot of variation from year to year depending on your soil, on your site, on your experience as a grower. You know, there's lots of things that might affect how productive a crop is. So you could, it allowed you to sort of be conservative about how much space you needed and how many plants you needed. Or, you know, if you're a really confident grower and you've got the best land, you might put in a really high total. Um, but basically what you do is you put in at that top, can you see the spreadsheet or is it very small? Um, anyway, you, at that button there, you put in how many people you want to feed, um, and then you put in with the crops the number that might be eaten per, per week. So, for instance, onions, we put that you're going to give half a kilo to every member per week. The number of weeks you want to supply them. So, you know, if you're doing all year round, you put 52 in. If you're doing a seasonal membership, you might put in, you know, 40 weeks. That will give you a total of, of how many kilos of onions you need to grow. You can put in the price as well. And then it's plumbed in to give you in that final box there, an area in hectares um, that it will um, that it will take up. Um, and obviously <clears throat> you can adjust it to put it in as meters squared instead of hectares, depending you know, if it's a smaller area and that's 0.065 of a hectare is probably not that useful. <laughs> but but, you know, so there's different ways you can you can adjust that yourself. Uh, so you go through, and you, you come out effectively then in this example with um, a total cropping area of 0.65 of a hectare. Uh, but then obviously you've got to build in some other assumptions. Uh, so one of them is your fertility building area. Um, and although in theory you can do uh, no dig with lots of organic amendments and no fertility breaks. In practice, I think for most systems that will be hard to achieve. I think, you know, and, and it doesn't give you any leeway really. Uh, so I would, if you can, I would recommend 
uh, you know, anything up to a quarter or even a third of your area in fertility building at any one time. And we'll come on in a bit to sort of ways of doing that within the cropping as well, um, if, if space and, uh, is an issue. And I know, you know, for a lot of people, you don't have a big land area and you want to get as much out of it as possible. But there is a risk if you push your system too hard that, that it works for three or four years and then start, you start to see problems. So, so building that, that fertility building bit into your system right from the start is really helpful. Um, and then I also put in a bit for crop failure. Um, you know, so you put in all of this, it assumes every crop works, everything produces. Um, and of course, we all know life isn't like that. And typically, you know, a number of crops will fail every year. Hopefully there'll be different crops every year. But um, so building that just into your overall planning assumptions helps. Uh, and so I guess you can work it both ways in a way. You can, you can say, I've got a hectare of land that I want to grow in and sort of jiggle it about until you work out how many people you can feed from that, or you can start from the assumption of how many people you want to feed. Um, so it's, you know, it's by no means a, a perfect foolproof um, tool, but it might be a sort of helpful starting point just in starting to get a grip about you know, how many people you can feed from your land or how many uh, hectares you might need to feed certain people. Um, and then Loxley Valley Community Farm did a, a sort of developed version of that. Um, which is also available on the network website. And they've sort of brought in things like, you know, the number of plants you need to, to fulfill that. They've even got um, sort of backup information about sort of where they got it. And so there's lots more detail behind it on there. Um, and, you know, you can obviously you can take those spreadsheets and adapt them, take the bits that are useful to you or not. Um, and they, they even end up with a, you know, a sort of crop planning jobs calendar that, that spews out of there. <clears throat> but both of those are available. So that combined probably with Tom's spreadsheet and you'll be there, you'll be set. <laughs> right, I'm gonna go back now to the presentation. I right, don't see that again. Yeah, so I thought I'd talk just a little bit about green manures. Um, the, so the green manures, are, it's all about capturing sunlight, building fertility, protecting soil. Uh, the, to, to, to sort of understand where the best places are in your rotation to to put those green manures, you won't necessarily know right at the start. So the best place really is to start with your, your cropping plan for the crops and then see where you can build them in. If possible, I would say you need a fertility break of 18 months minimum at some point during your rotation. So it might be that 20% of your land is in fertility building at any one point and it's, it's down for 18 months. Other people have longer fertility breaks or, or larger portions of their land. But as a, as a minimum, I would say 20% for 18 months would be a good starting point. Uh, but that's your long-term bit. Um, and, and typically you would sow that long-term green manure in maybe August or September. So after an early crop's come out. So again, thinking about where in the rotation that might be, it could be after potatoes or it could be after uh, I don't know, early harvested onions, something like that. Uh, so you would sow that, it would typically be a clover grass mix. So the more diverse you can make those long-term um, green, long-term uh, lays, the better. Uh, so you, you would effectively get it established before winter. It has the whole of that first winter, the whole of the second of that following year, and then the second winter. So it has two winters and a and a summer effectively and then you'd incorporate it in the spring um, before before you know planting or sowing worth as well just remembering that it needs about four weeks at least after incorporating before you sow things directly um, transplants are not such an issue but the 
the composing green manure, particularly ryegrass, can inhib inhibit germination of crops. So you don't want to be sowing directly too soon after incorporating that green manure. Uh, so that's your long term bit. There's also the opportunity for medium term, uh, I don't know, I call them medium term green manures. So that typically might be an overwintering green manure uh, four or five months. So again, it, it would go in in the autumn probably. Um, depending on what you're sowing and how warm you are, you can even, I mean, I've done a, a November sowing in a walled garden of um, rye uh, that I just about got away with. <clears throat> More typically, you'd sow it in September, October, but something like a rye and vetch mix, which is quite hardy, quite quick to establish, um, protects the soil, builds a bit of fertility over the winter, and then you incorporate that in the spring. But again, there's lots of options. That's just an example. So you're getting that benefit of protecting the soil over winter. And actually, as we get these warmer, wetter winters, you'll find those crops grow probably quite a bit over the winter. So you're getting quite a lot of benefit, even from that relatively short term. Uh, and actually, one of the um, trials we did as part of our innovative farmers um, field labs with a salad grower, where they just had a rye grass green manure for three or four months, they found their salads had better shelf life than where they weren't putting a green manure in. So there's some real benefits to that subsequent crop, even from relatively short term green manures. And then the other option is these really short term ones, things like phacelia or mustard, which can, you know, germinate really quickly in quite cool temperatures, will we'll do something even in four or five weeks. Um, and again, they just help to hold on to nutrients in the soil, protect it a bit. Um, so even after, I don't know, something like, uh, you know, garlic, if you're pulling the garlic up and then you were putting in an autumn sown planting of chard or something, you've got time for a quick mustard or phacelia sowing in between. And what I used to do, I mean, it's hard to, to remember it, but I had a, you know, a bag of the seed in the tractor. And as I was, as I was harvesting, I was just throwing a bit of seed on the ground and walking it in. And and it just it meant that you've got a bit of a cover. It grows quickly. It grows a bit more quickly than weeds um, and, and helps keep weeds out. So really just thinking about any opportunity of, of sowing something or keeping some cover over the ground, but how you fit that in with your, with your crop rotation. Um, so then the other option, so those are where you've got breaks in a crop and you're trying to fill it. There's also lots of opportunities for bringing in fertility and green manures in between your crops. So again, that, that idea that you don't want bare soil. Bare, bare soil is, means you're wasting light, light's being reflected back up, you're not capturing that sunlight, you're risking damage to soil, you're potentially losing nutrients. And these two pictures are at Ian Tolhurst farm, sort of the master of under sowing. So we've got um, runner beans, or French beans, can't quite remember, uh, with a clover under sowing, um, and then brassicas again here. Um, and I mean, it's a little bit of a, an art, um, and you'll need to work out which the best green manure crop is for where you are. Uh, so if you're dry, uh, so if you're over in the east of the country, you'll want something quite vigorous, and you may even need to irrigate it to start with. If you're in uh, West Wales, then you want probably something a bit smaller because otherwise the risk is that it smothers the crop. But basically anything quite tall or, or quite vigorous you can under -sow. So certainly beans, brassicas, courgettes and squashes, it works quite well, broad beans, um, lots of that sort of stuff. And as a general principle, what you will do is you'll get the crop established first and then sow the green manure. Um, if you, th there are also ways of planting into established green manures. Um, so projects and squashes, for instance, you can strip till, so just cultivate a strip into the green manure or dig a, dig a planting hole and plant that plant into it. It gets harder to, to manage the vigor of the green manure, but it can work. Um, this is a lot to think about with some of this stuff. And if you get a chance to read um, Ian Tolhurst's book, Growing Green, um, then I would recommend doing so. There's a lot of good stuff about green manures in there. Um, and then there's also, of course, into planting. I can't remember, Tom, whether you mentioned this in your bit, um, but, you know, where you've got something like radish or lettuce that grows very quickly, um, you know, potentially you can grow that in between um, 
other crops when they're established they're out quickly and then the other crop fills the space um, so that's another good way of if you you know if you're short of space it's quite a good way of maximizing that space it does make um, weed control and, and other things a bit more complicated so so a lot of the larger growers end up I mean I certainly on the bigger plots I managed I, I ended up not going into planting because it made it more complicated um, but if a lot of your work is is hand done and you've and space is an issue it's quite a good way of squeezing more crops in um, so this was uh, I think so looking if we're going to try and look at all of the propagation stuff it's slightly out of scope for uh, for the time we've got um I do think I mean uh, we're going to come on to, I'm going to mention seeds as well but this whole issue of availability of inputs I think is going to become more important um some of the vulnerabilities we've seen in our supply chains you know the whole reason why CSA is so it's such a strong concept is it it removes you from to some extent from the food system um, but most CSAs, I would say at the moment, are still reliant on buying in compost, buying on buying in seed. Um, so the more you can start to think about, well, actually, could I make my own propagation compost? Um, do I then need an area where I'm going to do that or, or bring in compost? You know, so thinking about where in the rotation, you might store it in a different place every year, but thinking about how you're going to propagate. The other question then is about how you propagate. So Tom mentioned he bought some of his modules in um, from Delfland. Uh, and I would say if you're starting out, actually not giving yourself the headache of propagating everything is probably quite sensible, particularly some of the sort of tender crops. You know, I gave up, although I love propagating, I gave up propagating tomatoes on one site because we didn't have enough heated space. We didn't look after them properly. We spent a lot of time and money watering them. And actually just buying in some really good plants from the propagator made a lot more sense. But where you can, direct sowing will give you probably a stronger plant and will be cheaper, but it means it's in the ground for longer. Uh, whereas if you sow in modules, typically you might, you know, you might be able to get it out into the into the field earlier because you brought it on in, in, in a tunnel but also you're able to keep the ground weed free for longer. So when you plant your module in, it's it's sort of ahead of the weeds. Whereas if you direct sow, it's alongside the weeds, they're all germinating at the same time. So there's no, there's not really that there's any right answer in this. It's just, it's all things to think about in terms of how long you need the ground for, how you're gonna plan, um, you know, what you're gonna buy and what you're not. Um, the the other thing again which is just worth thinking about is raising bare root transplants so these are usually brassicas and leeks are the ones that most people do where you sow directly into a seed bed in the soil um, and then pull them up as you can see in the picture as bare root transplants and then replant into their final position um, I love using bare root transplants. They do, in my opinion, they mostly do better than, particularly in brassicas, they mostly do better than module transplants. They give you a bit of flexibility uh, in terms of planting time. So modules, you know, there's a tiny amount of soil in a module and as the plant gets big, it starts to suffer. And the longer it's in the module, the more of a growth check there'll be when you, when you plant it. Um, so if you have a spring where the weather's awful and you can't get out and cultivate and you can't plant and your poor plants are in their modules going, feed me, water me, and I'm running out of space, um, you end up suffering. Whereas if they're in the ground, they're quite happy. They're sitting there. They can get quite big and you can still transplant them. You could potentially, you know, if you've got a crop that's still doing quite well um, and you're having to make a decision about, do I take that crop out and plant the new one in? You might get an extra week if you've got bare root transplants. Um, whereas the modules, you might be going, actually the modules have to go in the ground. It's just, it potentially gives you a bit of flexibility. Of course, they take up a bit of space in your tunnel or, or in your soil. So you've got to factor that space into your crop planning if you're doing bare root transplants. Um, as well as the green manure fertility bit, obviously there's opportunities to bring in um, organic amendments, so you know, compost, wood chip, <coughs> um, mushroom compost, manure, that sort of thing. Um, I'm not going to go into much detail about 
sort of what to use or when it depends a little bit on on what you can get hold of to some extent um but again just thinking about when you apply it as a general rule it's probably best to apply it to a growing green manure crop um or possibly the end of a you know a growing crop it's not great to add it onto bare soil if you can avoid it i mean it's not the end of the world if you have to so again thinking about when you want to apply that manure and building that into your crop planning um, and how you're going to incorporate it and you know if you've got to store some piles of manure storing them near to where you're going to be um, spreading them you know so trying to think ahead a little bit in terms of um, of when and where you're going to use uh, any amendments uh, watering is not a big consideration but it is it's just sometimes thinking about you know if you, if you know that there's going to be a number of crops that you're going to have to irrigate at the same time if you've got them all next to each other it means you don't have to lug irrigation equipment across the site and back again um so you know it's not it's not probably a massive issue on on smaller scale but certainly on bigger scale operations you can spend a lot of time moving irrigation and pipes um so it's just something to think about uh seed production again probably for most of you at the start i wouldn't necessarily recommend you start producing your own seed but uh, you know, there have been seed shortages um, there, you know, the, <clears throat> I think that's likely to become more of a problem. Um, there's some issues around importing seed at the moment with Brexit, although hopefully that's a temporary thing. Um, but seed is quite expensive. Um, and for some things, you know, like beans, for instance, or tomatoes, it's quite easy to save some of your own seed. Um, so, but it takes space and it does mess up your rotations a bit. Um, you know, you think, oh yeah, I can get all of that crop out. Oh no, I've got to leave some of it to see. Uh, so I think probably for most growers, it relies, I think in a way where, where CSAs have a strength, you might have someone in your group or one of your members that actually is quite up for doing some seed saving and, and would take charge of it because it can be a bit of a distraction. But long-term, I think growers, um, are starting to think more about how they um, become less dependent on other people to produce seed for, and I think probably we need to. Um, so yeah, so this is sort of when to get rid of old crops. So this is a, a um, picture of a great grower called Martin Bragg, who's down in, in Devon, and he was showing some of our trainee growers around. And this is an old field of, I can't quite remember what crop, um, and and he was he basically said you know ten years ago he'd have just gone in and he'd have flailed it down and, and then he'd have had to do something with it, whereas now he's leaving it um, and particularly cabbages um, if they're left over winter that's the perfect habitat for the parasitic wasps that kill cabbage white butterflies so if you can leave flowering brassicas over winter the chances are you'll have no cabbage white the next the next year. So, you know, I'm thinking of it as a positive habitat and resource for, for wildlife rather than <clears throat> a messy problem that needs to be dealt with. Um, or, you know, if you do need to, you know, if you do need the land, can you leave just a strip of it um, for the habitat, even if you can't leave it all? Um, and then finally, uh, tunnels are tricky with rotations because basically most of the crops that grow in tunnels are either brassicas or solanaceae. So getting, getting a decent rotation with different plant families is much harder um, under cover. <coughs> um, the top picture is uh, an amazing place up in Cheshire called Oakcroft Gardens. And there's a grower called Mare Fardungi, who's now about 91 um, and retired, but she was one of the very first organic growers in the UK um, in 19. 69 or something she started um, and she's got these movable glass houses so they're on runners and they they can slide back and forth between two positions and you can get so there are some tunnel designs that people have been working on to do the same um, but the benefit with that is you effectively can get three crops or sometimes even four crops under under cover because you you move you know you start something uh, you start something outside or you can start something inside, let it carry on outside or, you know, so it gives you so much flexibility. Um, but anyway, a bit complicated, but if you, if you 
if you've got an engineer in your membership, they might be worth getting them onto um, developing a movable tunnel. Uh, but again, it's it's more just about uh, thinking about how you plan that very valuable tunnel space. <clears throat> and you know, if if you're talking about uh, profit, then most winter crops under tunnels, I would say, are more profitable than summer crops. Um, so you know, being able to supply winter salad all year round um, is likely to 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 make more financial sense than growing tomatoes, for instance. Um, that that said, your members probably want some tomatoes, so it's not necessarily an either or, but but it's sort of really understanding where the the value is because for most growers, tunnel space is at a premium, um, and so you really want to make the most of that tunnel space. Um, and you can <clears throat> you can under sow in tunnels, for instance, um, but it's harder. Um, you need to sort of treat it more like a crop and keep it watered, and then it can get really big. So I have successfully under under sown tomatoes in tunnels, for instance, but um, but I would say generally it's probably trickier. And then the other thing is just to think about using cloches and portable covers in the field as well as big tunnels. So sometimes just covering a crop for the first three or four weeks to get it started um, can make a big difference to how quickly it, it matures. Um, but there's a, you know, again, there's a labour element to that. Um, but potentially, if you've got volunteer labourers to, you know, move a whole load of cloches one week, that could be quite useful. <coughs> so I think that that's, yeah, that's the end of my official bit. Let me stop sharing. So yeah. Thanks, Ben. Any questions? Right. Yeah. Ask questions, people. Anyone have any questions? There must be some out there. I've got questions if if I'm allowed to ask questions. Yeah, go for can it, I, Tom. Can I go? So so there was a couple of things. Um, like the 18 months fertility. I was just wondering because you know, actually we'd struggle to have an 18 month fertility in one of our sites. Um, and I realize that's ideal. So we but we don't. We have probably like you know, at a stretch, 12 months, um, sometimes that even slightly less. I just wonder, do you think that's going to be problematic in the long run? It, probably not <laughs> in one sense. So, I mean, so all of this is, you know, you start with these general principles and then you actually, you have the reality of running, you know, running your operation and there's all kinds of constraints on that. Um, you know, it depends what else you're doing as part of that rotation. It depends what you're growing. It depends how much organic matter you're adding in. It depends whether you're cultivating the soil and damaging it. So there's lots of things that will have an impact on that long-term success. Um, you, you know, you have to work within the constraints you've got. And if all you can manage is 12 months or less, then that's, you know, then that's what you do. And and hope you don't see problems but keep an eye out for them you know it's like in the same way that if you can't get hold of organic, organic matter you say well okay i might need to leave longer because I, I can't build the fertility and structure soil structure in another way so you know there's no there's no one size fits all to any of this and you know although some of this stuff sounds really complicated actually the basics of it are relatively straightforward and it's and it's just learning what's right for your site and and your you know your customers and what crops you're growing um you know again it depends it depends how heavy feed of the crop you know are you growing lots of brassicas or are you are you growing something else so all of these things have an impact so i don't mm. you know I, I doubt tom it will cause you a problem mm. um and the other thing i guess is you know you're a skilled experienced grower so you're you know you're likely to be making fewer other errors whereas if you're starting out having a long rotation will help to buffer any of those problems so I mean I remember one year when I started out and I was it was a really horrible wet spring and I was on quite heavy soil and it was getting later and later and I hadn't got the shallots on and I panicked a bit and went in and plowed and I just shouldn't have done and I did a few rows and went, oh my god I'm, <laughs> I've made such a mess here um, and you know I waited a, a, another a week and a half really was all it took for the land to dry out went in cultivated the rest of the plot 
the lots I put in in the second half easily overtook the first lot where I buggered up the soil. Uh, but, you know, that 18 months fertility after that effectively really helped to undo some of those mistakes that I, you know, that damage that I've done to the soil. So it's, it's an insurance policy as well as, as well as kind of fertility building, I guess. Hmm. That's great. Thank you. There was one other or two other brief ones was like, one was um, what would you recommend for under sowing, under sowing squash and brassica? And then you talked about the rye, once it's turned in, that can hold back the germination of other seeds. Is that just rye or is that other crops that will hold back? So I start with the rye. I think it's particularly rye. Um, but I think any, you know, any crop that is incorporated, it takes a while for the biology and the soil to break that down. So there's sort of lots of nutrients floating about. And, and so it can just, it can prevent good germination. So the rye is the particular problem. Mm. Um, and then uh, under sowing <clears throat> again, it does depend a little bit on your soil uh, and what you're under sowing. But um, mo the mode that I tended to use, and bear in mind I haven't done this for a few years, but I tended to use white clover and yellow trefoil mix. Mm. Um, they're both relatively low growing, um, so even if they do sort of get away, they they shouldn't overcompete with with some of those particularly sort of brassicas and things. Squashes are a little bit trickier because they're lower growing. So if they don't get a really good start, um, they can get smothered. Um, I remember Nathan Richards, who's a grower over in West Wales, really good grower over in West Wales. He, the first time he tried it, he did it with red clover, which is what Ian Tollers uses in very dry Berkshire. And he, you know, he said he, he couldn't find the squash. They were under there, but he was having to go through his feet feeling them. And it was just like this your waist high clover so so it's a little bit then in a dry year it might not have done that at all so so it will vary um it's it's mm. a sort of slightly dark art but um but mm. definitely worth experimenting with but yeah generally i would i would recommend lower growing um clovers um because they're less likely to compete and, and they will give you a good cover as well great thanks can i just ask a question about soft fruit um, in Herefordshire, there's a lot of soft fruit or strawberries grown under polytunnels or in polytunnels. Um, and the market garden I grew up on a long time ago, um, we used to grow early strawberries under cloches. It's before the strawberries moved into the, onto the tables in the polytunnels. Um, but raspberries here are also grown in polytunnels. And I just, CSAs don't seem to grow, much. oh, am I wrong? Do CSAs grow soft fruit? And what's the value if they do? I mean, uh, I mean, I would say field grown soft, uh, field grown raspberries, I would definitely, if you, you know, unless you're really short of space, I think it's definitely worth putting them in, even if you have them as a pick your own crop. <clears throat> Autumn raspberries, for instance, are so easy to look after, really, um, that, that is, I would, I would say it's worth doing. The, the problem with, with soft fruit generally is it takes so long to pick, you know, that's, and, and you've got a very short window of getting it to your members. So that's the challenge with it is uh, you need, ideally you need to refrigerate it almost as soon as you've picked it. Um, you see, so you, you know, you need, I mean, it depends. If, if you know all of your members are coming to pick up that, that evening, then you could do it. But it is a big part of it is the labour cost. You know, that's why soft fruit is quite expensive in supermarkets. Although it grows relatively well, it just takes forever to pick and it's quite fragile. So, um, you know, it's why box schemes don't really do much soft fruit because it sits on a, someone's doorstep for half a day in the sun and it's a mush by the time they get it. So that's the challenge with it. So I guess it depends on the structure of your CSA. You know, and the, the tunnels most, um, the little bit of the tunnels is for early or late protection. Most of it is actually just to protect it from rain and make sure that you get a crop every year because most soft fruit, you know, particularly raspberry and strawberries are very susceptible to botrytis and, you know, mold. And, you know, if it rains, you can't pick for a day or it goes rotten and that's it. So a lot of the, a lot of the reason for the plastic on soft fruit is to 
to make sure they get a crop every year and you know, protect their investment. Um, and I would suspect for most CSAs, it's not worth putting soft fruit under tunnels, but might be wrong. But worth trying, but, but I would, you know, I definitely have some soft, uh, you know, fruit bushes and you know, currants and raspberries and stuff. You know, are uh, they're relatively cheap. They're relatively easy to look after. Um, and it's the picking that's the problem. But if you, you know, if you had to pick your own or a kind of, you know, just come and pick a few when you pick up your boxes or whatever it is that, you know, adds value and, and is, you know, a nice thing to have on the, on the farm, but. Yeah, thank you. That's maybe what we do is have a small area of pick your own fruit. I don't know. <laughs> thank you. I wanted to ask a couple of things. Um, one was, how do you record keep? I mean, Tom, you were talking a lot about um, kind of noticing that something didn't work the year before, so not growing it. So, like, how are you actually physically record keeping and does it work? And the second one was, uh, Ben, like, this is probably another obvious question, but what would be the things, like, in terms of soil fertility that you'd be looking for to sort of go, oh, actually, this isn't working so well or my soil's losing fertility? Do you want to start, Tom? Or should I start? Yeah, I'll, yeah. I'll go on then. I mean, um, actually, I was just thinking, partly it's just from discussion and remembering. So actually, we have growers meetings and we'll sort of, you know, we'll bring up issues. One particular good growers meeting we'll have at the end of the season where we'll plan the next season. But I use actually just notes on my phone. And I've just, I just got lots of notes for where I've sown certain crops or things that I, I noticed bolted early. And I'll just make a quick note on my phone and then I'll kind of scroll through that when we meet in, an, in autumn to see what stuff I've written there through the summer. Thanks, Tom. And I just also wanted to say we have got on when our website's up and running, uh, one of our CSAs um, did a crop planner, well, a sort of harvesting tool that's a Google form where you put in what you planted and what you do to it and then what comes out at the end, which is quite useful. So you'll find that on our website uh yeah so the signs of things going wrong i think it was what you asked wasn't it? um i mean some of it is um is just looking at the plants and seeing whether they're growing well seeing whether you've got a you know, nutrient deficiency for instance um <clears throat> and that might not be because the nutrient isn't in the soil it might be because you've got compaction or uh sometimes if you've got too much of one nutrient it can cause locking up of another one so this is can be a problem if you put on compost every year you effectively are adding a lot of potassium and phosphorus which can then lock up other nutrients so that's something to be aware of if you've got a no dig system where you're putting on uh you know compost or, or wood chip or something every year there's a there's a risk of that um it's not you know it doesn't always happen but it's something to keep to keep an eye on um but the other thing is just to sort of dig holes fairly regularly um and you know and check your soil because um, you can you know you can see and smell and you know if you've got wet patches forming when it rains you know you've got a problem there so a lot of it is just it's observation and looking at your soil I mean if you're taking on a new site I think it's worth doing a soil test a soil analysis of that site it gives you a good baseline it'll it'll show you whether you've got any uh, you know specific deficiencies so we have some soils in the UK are copper deficient or boron deficient and there's not really much you can do about that apart from adding an amendment. So that's worth knowing about your site if you know if you happen to be deficient in that. Most of the other stuff, you know, even if there is a problem, you'll get over that with good soil management and you know all of the stuff we were talking about with um, soil fertility and green manures and you know crop cultivation and stuff. So, um, but yeah, it's it's a lot of it is about observation. Um, Okay, I, think, I think you were going to ask a question. Hi, um, I was just wondering if you know of anybody who is producing their own propagation compost and what sort of um, setup that, that entails. So I do, um, and Ian Tolhurst, who I've mentioned in other respects, who is sort of the, you know, he's the the growing god he's um he's very very good grower um and if you get a chance to visit him i would um so he yeah he absolutely is and he's producing it from wood chip um and 
sort of slightly, you know, the received wisdom is that that it's not possible. Actually, he seems to do it in a very low tech system. He gets wood chip from local tree surgeon. He piles it up uh, in windrows, uh, puts some uh, puts the bits of his crop waste that he's got, which is not very much. It's mostly wood chip, and he turns it a few times, uh, and then he leaves. A, so most of that goes back onto his soil as a soil health amendment so not really about fertility um, there is a bit of fertility in there but it's more about boosting soil health but then a small proportion of that he effectively rots down for a bit longer so in the end it has about 18 months um, and then he, he basically gets this fantastic propagation compost um, out of it he, he, he adds a little bit of um, I think a biochar and possibly a bit of perlite just to give it a bit more structure and again, we did a, a, another innovative farmer's field lab with him where we looked at the compost. We compared it against a, a leading peat-based propagation compost and there was pretty much no difference between the plants. Um, so it's definitely possible. Um, and, and I don't think it's that hard. Uh, I mean, there are, there are potentially risks and, you know, obviously uh tolly is a particularly good grower um so you know it might be that if you're you know not quite as on the ball as he is you might see problems but i think it's definitely worth experimenting with but you know yeah do 10 percent of your sowings in it to start with <laughs> rather than risk everything but but you know the, i think there's the the risk of green using green waste compost as opposed to wood chips so you know the stuff from that you'll get from all of your residues it's a great compost but if you try to propagate seedlings in it there's often too high uh, salt concentration so it can it can cause germination problems particularly for some of the smaller seeds um, whereas wood chip doesn't have much nitrogen in it um, you know it's quite low uh, in nitrogen content so that I think that's why it seems to do to do better great thank you very much Thanks. Any final questions before we end? Adam. Yeah, I've got a quick one. Um, would you, we've got a, a field which was pasture for horses a while back, um, but we're not going to use it all probably for certainly not in the coming year, if not the next year. Some people have suggested I should cover as much of it as I can to get it ready for sort of killing off what's there ready for future years. But there's an awful lot of grass and clover but with sort of what you're saying about clover being a green manure and stuff would we be better off just letting the clover do its thing for a while and deal yeah. with it when we need to yeah i would say definitely if, if you've got a good clover grass the, the problem with a lot of x horse fields is there's not a lot of left in it so if you happen to have a fair amount of clover and grass in there i would definitely leave it um, quite, and quite just top it. As well. sorry there are quite a lot of thistles as well. That's the only problem. Yeah, so you, you you will need to manage it, and you know, yes, it would be worth trying to get on top of the thistles. Whether are they creeping thistle or yeah, creeping thistle. Yeah, so um, the ideal time for, to to get rid of them is sort of July. So there's the old saying with creeping thistles is cut them in May, they'll come another day. Cut them in June, still too soon. Cut them in July, they're sure to die. <laughs> the idea is you wait until they're just about to flower and seed. They put all their energy into it and then you chop them down. Okay. Um, so I would definitely, yeah, it's worth doing that. Um, and you'll need to probably, you know, top or I don't know if you've got some sheep you can borrow just to sort of keep it under control. And then I would just cover the bits for a couple of months before you use them. So, you know, that or, or if I don't know, or you can cultivate them, obviously. But, um, but yeah, I definitely wouldn't cover the whole thing. Okay. Basically, once you cover it, it kills off a lot of the life underneath. Uh, well, depending on what you cover it with, um, but effectively, it's not it's not building its soil health once it's covered. So it's a good technique for preparing the soil prior to planting. But you would you want to do it in a way for as short a time as you need to to get the you know to get ready for planting, rather than a yeah. You, know, you certainly wouldn't want it under cover for a year or something. I would say. Okay. Cool. Thanks for that. One more question. Anyone got a final question? No? 
Okay, uh, Ben and Tom, anything you realise you haven't said that you want to add any more gems of wisdom before we all go? Um, I, I think it's like, a, it's a, I'd say it's a slow process, all the crop planning. I feel like I'm still learning loads now. And every time I go to another farm, I learn, you know, something that I hadn't ever thought of doing. But it's like, actually, you've got to sort of get the basics in your head and then gradually you can take in these other elements of it. Like all the all the green manuring I find is once you've got a good crop plan going, you can start to really question how to fit everything else in. But I find it's a slow process and it's and it's always adapting and changing and learning. Yeah, I agree. And there was one thing actually that did occur to me, particularly for those of you that are um, buying in some stuff and you, you will have to make a decision about what to buy and what to grow yourself. Um, and I would definitely just avoid some of the really difficult crops. You know, don't grow aubergines. Don't, I wouldn't grow cauliflowers. I know you're doing them, Tom. I gave up growing. I never, never had a decent cauliflower crop. I mean, I had a few decent cauliflowers, but I never had a decent cauliflower crop. You know, and, and some of those trickier crops, if you know, if you have to buy in something, buy in either buying the stuff that's really cheap or buying the stuff that's really difficult to grow and leave it to the experts. Mm -hmm. advice okay thank you all i'm gonna uh, thank ben and tom for all of that um and thank you all for coming and listening and asking questions good luck crop planning and um i'm gonna stop the recording now and see you all soon you, susie you did you did say uh that uh we if people do want to get in touch afterwards um they're very welcome to do to contact me i'll just stick my um email quickly in the chat um and tom i don't know i can't remember oh, you... go on i'll stick mine in as well um <laughs> let me see can i brilliant thanks both of you and uh, yeah the recording i will um send out a link to the recording to all of you and it will also be on our website and just um we in the series of webinars we're doing with the lwa oga and seed um saving Seed Sovereignty Network. We're doing one. There was a question about composting. Nikki Scott is doing a webinar on composting for us on the 24th of November. That's a Wednesday. It's in the evening. It's not up on Eventbrite yet, but it will be soon. So if you want to know how to compost, watch out for that. Okay. Uh, you've got both of those in the chat. I'll also put those in the email with the link to the um, recording. Thanks, everybody, and bye. Thanks, Love you all. Bye.